am with my good friend, Kirk Lehman. And uh, we met last year, soon after, which I think we discovered we're both interested in what's happening right now in this country as it relates to identity politics and the overall pluralism of our country. Uh, wokeness, of course, is the elephant in the room. And I think we developed an interest in the topic by slightly different ways. For me, it was living overseas and recognizing how much tribalism ravaged some of the countries that I was living in. And if I understand correctly, you, uh, prior to taking issue with wokeness, were kind of woke yourself? Yeah, uh, but I actually started before that. I mean, I grew up in, in the rural Midwest, ultra conservative. So I was, that's how I was raised. And I was very hardcore Republican. This is when I was younger, in, I didn't like, know that. in like the 90s, so okay. <laughs> early 2000s, I guess, like high school. Um, and then uh, very re very religious as well, mm. and just was, was uh, like an ultra-conservative Christian type. Mm. So that's how, that's how I grew up. And, and thought a lot about that, eventually became uh, non-religious, and went the opposite direction. And at that point, I was a Democrat and drifted into ultra, uh, I guess, what we now call wokeism. It wasn't really called that back then, mm. or it was a new term. As I became part of that, I, I, I realized that was a, there was a very similar uh, pathology, you know, very similar to actually conservative Christianity mm. uh, with, with, with regard to the dogma. Original sin and that type of thing. Mm. So, and the original sin and wokeness mm. is whiteness. Right, right. Um, Which and we'll talk about. It's very time. hierarchical and um, it's not a lot of critical thinking that goes into to the extremes mm. on both sides. So I kind of was very, very far right, very far left. And then I just spent a lot of time reading about politics and philosophy and, and uh, landed in the sort of the anti-woke left arena around the time probably that I, that I uh, met you. Did you have an aha moment? Was it unsettling to come to the realization that wokeism had some parallels with what you were trying to escape? I, I realized it fairly quickly because I'd already had that experience with, yeah. with the far right mm -hmm. as, as being part of that. So once you, once you see it, it's, you see it once you see it much more quickly yep um, and we're going to be talking about uh, some of the characteristics that come out of fervent religiosity here in just a bit um, the sort of self-righteousness the blindness uh, uh, as as they pursue a kind of utopian ideal yep. if you will uh, and how that's affecting the arts and we'll talk about affirmative action yeah uh, the actual uh, you the idea, the utopian ideal, is is very common link between both sides. There's this mm. sort of uh, false notion of of uh, and uh, Stephen Pinker talks about this too. What mm. the, the problems of, of this utopian ideal, where you, if it exists, then you should try to achieve it by any means. I was just uh, going to say, right, by any means which, necessary it, is the that's application. That's a problem on both sides. So it's it's very problematic. Right as much as I hate that word in, in that sense. Uh, mm. no. It's one area that uh, we've uh, seen uh, wokeness uh, take hold uh, is in the arts. I was reading today in uh, the Free Press that uh, artists nationwide say they're being put to an ideologic litmus test. Um, is this of concern? Should it be? I think it's of concern. I, it's not a surprise to me that that it's the arts is susceptible to to wokeness. I mean, it's all it's, it's always a, a left leaning, mm. and oftentimes a radical left leaning mm. uh, a place to be within universities and humanities, arts. They all sort of fall into that, and oftentimes, I think historically for the best, I think they've been right most of the time. Right uh, about what? About progress. Mm. Uh, the, these were the original organizations that were um, pro-choice and um, 
pro-gay marriage. Mm. Uh, I think they have a pretty good track record. So it's easy to just assume that they're uh, still on the right track. Mm. Uh, but in this case, I don't think so. What do you see that suggests they're not on the right track? Um, it's, it's not opposed to racism. It's actually promoting racism. Mm. And, and uh, <laughs> individual free thought, you know, there's, we are uh, a theater company, so we have to align with this uh, ideology, with, with this political stance. It seems to me that art can't flourish in such an environment. Correct. Uh, as, especially when people feel that they can't express themselves openly the arts are dependent on free and open expression. I remember being in Malaysia and I had some artistic friends there and I always pitied them because when we talked about what they were creating or conceptualizing, um, it always started from what can I say? And I thought back to my time in America and recognized, man, I was free of that responsibility. My canvas was just a big open canvas. And now so many artists that you speak to uh, say they fear uh, offending the powers that be. Uh, and I think that there's huge uh, implications for the greatness of America's output and therefore its civilizational significance if this gets too out of control. It's, it's awesome to see, to see something that's um, an artist performing at the top of their game, right, and that's why you go to to see the ballet. That's why you go to the symphony. <laughs> Once you um, s stop stop admitting people based off of just their uh, s expertise and their incredible these are people at the top point oh oh one percent of of their craft. Mm. And that's what you go to see, and mm -hmm. you can tell. I mean, if that, if you appreciate that art, you can tell when you go to see it. If if it's, I mean, you can tell the difference between. Uh, an NBA game and uh, uh, the backyard game we were playing <laughs> yeah, earlier. Yeah. <laughs> or the same with, with um, a ballet or something the other thing. Speaking of which, um, the Buffalo Philharmonic, this is an article from last year but still relevant to what we're talking about, uh, headline reads, no white or Asian conductors need apply. I think this was in the conservative uh, publication in the National Review. Um, as it relates to uh, orchestras, uh, they have now for decades used blind auditions mm -hmm. uh, whereby uh, those uh, evaluating the talent cannot see right. the race or gender of uh, those trying out. Um, it has come under attack, the notion of blind orchestras, at some of the nation's top orchestras on the grounds that it has resulted in the hiring of too few non-Asian musicians of color. Different cultures have different values and you can have a whole other discussion about that, but um, I think it's the best illustration of the contamination of wokeness out there. One of the best is, is the blind auditions going away because this actually was implemented in like the early 70s yeah, or late in 60s. order to um, prevent biased selection of um, members of an orchestra. Yeah. And it worked. Uh, they actually realized that there was bias in, in the judging of, of, of these artists. And there was more women that were um, selected to right. be part of the, are, are these highly selective orchestras like the Philharmonic. Uh, and now the most progressive among us ostensibly are saying blind auditions actually are racist because you can't tell the race of the uh, person. And you should be able to select on, you know. Which is very Orwellian and it's yeah. twisted yeah. logic, and right? So it's, it's a really good way to, to sort of illustrate what's, what's gone wrong with, with, with being progressive. And, mm -hmm. Progressive, uh, you mean? Right, progressive. Mm -hmm. um, and people that support this really are, do truly believe that they are being progressive and they're doing the right thing. They're not trying, mm. they're not like, they don't think of themselves as racist and, mm. and you have to give some, some benefit of the doubt, but it's a problem.
Yeah. Uh, One argument for doing this was made uh, controversially in a New York Times article by their former uh, classical music critic. Um, he writes, uh, blind auditions are based on an appealing premise of pure meritocracy, but ask anyone in the field and you'll learn that over the past century of increasingly professionalized training, there has come to be a remarkably little difference between players at the top tier. There is an athletic component to playing an instrument, and as with sprinters, gymnasts, and tennis pros, uh, the basic level of technical skill among American instrumentalists has steadily risen. A typical orchestral audition might end up attracting dozens of people who are essentially indistinguishable in their musicianship and technique. And I read this in astonishment because I think the harebrained conclusion here is that uh, somebody's skin color is necessarily going to produce diversity in musicianship. It fails to recognize that there can be great diversity within a particular racial category and simply going outside of that is no guarantee for uh, greater eccentricity and diversity in artistic expression. I think a, a common argument is, you know, you want, you want little black boys and, and girls or, or brown boys and girls to be able to look at a, at this at the symphonies, these orchestras, and see, see, themselves. see themselves there. Um, and so by sort of artificially building those mm. into, the, in, into these groups, it will somehow organically produce more um, uh, people of color. Now, what do you think about that? So I'm ambivalent about that whole idea um, in that, uh, you know, it's this notion also on screen. It's like, oh, well, I, I, I see myself in the, the, the Black Little Mermaid and stuff. But mm -hmm. why, what we should be doing is learning to see commonalities that we have with other people that transcend uh, essentialist categories. Um, I should learn to be able to relate to a talented woman or a talented mm -hmm. black person. And I remember growing up, you know, playing baseball, and um, there were people that fell outside of my race that uh, certainly appealed to me and that, that I saw a little bit of myself in them. Um, and so I think there's some truth to it, but there's limitations to it. And we should be training our little boys and girls uh, to see commonality beyond simply skin color. And it's also possible that that's just not a, a interest. It's not part of black culture that much as it is part of Asian culture. Mm. It's just it's just not, you know, that's just something mm. that is really part of that culture. This is where kids are often pushed to play an instrument, mm -hmm. especially uh, the cello or the violin, you know, and and that's okay. You can have different values within different groups of people. Right. Obviously, you can look at the NBA and say there's no there's no racism going on when it comes to selecting NBA players. There's they want to make money and win and they're going to pick whoever is the best. Uh, and that happens to be almost all black people. Right. So a lot of what we're talking about uh, ties into uh, loosely or not so loosely uh, Affirmative action, uh, which is on the radar of the Supreme Court. Uh, justices later this year will hear challenges to racial preferences in admissions at both Harvard and UNC, University of North Carolina. The, the place that I would start, and I'll ask you this, do you think there was ever a time in history where, without a doubt, affirmative action was the ethical and correct policy? Like, I, say, 1965. I've spent my whole life, basically, being pro-affirmative yeah, action. Um, and one of the best analogies I heard uh, in support of affirmative action uh, was that um, uh, it, it's a bit like a train stopping. Um, you could say, for example, you know, acute racism in America ended decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
starting with the civil rights era, but it takes a long time for the train to stop. Right. And obviously there were abuses of black America uh, that are still reverberating today. And I think that has to be considered. And yet the more I've thought about this, and I've been forced to think more about it as we've sort of entered a new neo-racist era that is putting so much emphasis on skin color, judging people and hiring people accordingly, um, even outside of the formal regulated affirmative action sense, uh, I, I've, I've learned that they're unfairly are victims uh, as a result of this desire to fix a wrong. And that's why I'm more ambivalent than I've ever been towards yeah, affirmative I am, action. I am too. I would say only in the past year or two have I started to question whether it was a good thing. But that mostly comes from, most, I've been mostly convinced by um, black intellectuals who have been arguing against it, like Ben Lowry and uh, John McWhorter have a lot of in-depth conversations mm -hmm. on this. Uh, I've heard testimonies from like, uh, like black firemen who are just like, I don't want this hanging over me. Like basically I, I get uh, the impression that people think that I'm here because uh, I'm black, not because I'm qualified. Um, because I've gotten a hand out of yeah, and and they're like it's stop like it's it's hurting it's hurting us it's not helping us and on the other end a, a, a lot of black intellectuals are saying no it's the only way to to achieve equality uh, so it's uh, tricky it's very tricky I but if you can come to if you can ad admit that there was a time um, when it was a good thing which I think we agree on then you have to say that it is contextual, that it's not a bad mm. thing. My concern also I was, was shaped by my time in Malaysia where there is an affirmative action program that benefits the majority of Malays. Uh, Malaysia is one of the few multiracial countries in Asia. 60% uh, of the population is Malay, uh, roughly 30% Chinese, 8% Indian, the rest indigenous uh, people. Uh, and it was initially implemented, uh, I think it was 1971, called the New Economic Policy, uh, because there were race riots. And Malays lashed out because they were economically disadvantaged, despite being the majority of the population. And so they implemented an affirmative action program, recognizing that this instability, which they never wanted to experience again, w was related to the economic disparity between the two groups. It was supposed to last for 20 years. They, they, they have extended it indefinitely since then and it has bred a whole lot of racial resentment it's also bred a lot of cronyism mm -hmm. and so you're seeing a lot of malays who aren't in desperate need who are very well connected who are benefiting from the program and it's actually producing mediocrity in business because you need malay people on boards and they just sit there and are basically rent seekers uh, and getting their pockets lined uh, while many of uh, the more desperate malays are suffering um, and so uh, I think a stronger case is now being made for uh, greater class consciousness because you do have people who fall outside right. of the African-American community who desperately need help as well. And I can't help but think that some of the, the trends that I was alluding to earlier relating to the polls are the result of uh, people generally in America who have had enough of, of, of uh, over... Uh, obsession with race, um, hyper race consciousness. And if that's the environment in which people are promoting affirmative action, might there be unintended consequences that end up canceling to some degree the benefits intended? I, I was reading about the uh, Malaysian phenomenon as well, which is quite remarkable. It seems that it's, it's at this point done the opposite of of mending race relations in, in Malaysia mm. to the point where it's considered one of the most racist like countries on earth. It's very there's racist. so much uh, contempt for oh man for the other, which I you live there. Or and people so, in America have no idea yeah. how much worse <laughs> really? race relations can get. I had like um, I can pull this up here. Mm. John McWhorter, who who talks a lot about this, um, who is a, a black linguist at Columbia professor there. Uh, he pointed out in, in a book I was reading by him 
Uh, this is at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, mm. which is just a couple of miles from where we are right now. Okay, so before this went into effect, before affirmative action was made illegal in public institutions. In California. Meaning you couldn't admit students on the basis of race. You had to use uh, other parameters like testing and so on. So before that, there was one out of 3,268 freshmen, uh, one black student was on honors. This is the year before. Yeah. The year after, one out of five made honors, which is the same as uh, white students. So his argument was, it can only help because you're actually being admitted into a group of peers that are uh, performing at the same level as you, or scoring at the same level. And when you're in, a, when when you're mismatched, even if you're in the top. 96% and your peers are all in the top 99% because they had higher standards than they, people feel inadequate or they don't feel like they can perform or, or there's tougher um, testing and so on. So his, his, um, this is a, a very compelling statistic in, in, that, in that one year it went from one out of 3,000 to one in five. Um, just by getting rid of affirmative action for black students that were part of, that made honors, which mm. is the same as the rest of the population. Right. Because they're all being held at the same standard. Instead of, uh, all that being said, I still don't know what I think about affirmative action. Mm -hmm. I, it's a very hard question for me. Fair enough. Well, stay uh, tuned. The Supreme Court has a <clears throat> decision coming up soon, yeah. and uh, we'll let it rest there. Thanks very yeah. much for being here, and hope to see you again here at our jungle hideout. Mm -hmm in yeah. Central America very soon. We're in Guatemala. Let's go party. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.